Today's presenter is Joshua Corsa, who has been trying and sometimes succeeding at saving lives as a paramedic for more than 13 years. He's currently a flight paramedic with the city of Virginia Beach. He has also worked as a firefighter paramedic in the Seattle area, Western North Carolina, and here in Pitt County. A writer and photographer in past life, he is currently a second year medical student here at Brody and is hoping to pursue a career in trauma surgery. So here's Josh Corsa to speak on bringing the medicine to the patient, a tangled history of pre-hospital medicine, or... <laughs> I guess I shouldn't have changed the PowerPoint beforehand, <laughs> but... Uh... Brandy, hearses, and television, an irreverent history of pre-hospital medicine. The Josh. more I read, the more I just decided that it just, alcohol, television, and hearses was a much more appropriate title for this presentation. Now, thank you for the introduction. Um, so, yeah, just going to talk about how we ended up today with ambulances and went from here to here. So, back when we were in the ye old ages and the middle ages and times, if you got hurt on the battlefield, what do you think happened to you? You died. Or you just kind of laid there. You pretty much right. There was no system in place to carry anyone back. Uh, I mean, bouncing back and forth between my notes, but like at the Battle of Bunker Hill, the general Horatio Gates for the revolutionary soldiers left his troops on the field as long as three days before he came to collect them. And then when they came back, they actually had to pay for their own care and for their transport because the surgeons at the time were not terribly motivated. They got paid $1.66 a day, which is about 20 bucks a day in today's times. So I can't imagine I would be terribly motivated. So if you had a very progressive general or commander, who didn't want to let you sit on the field, there was one other option available. And that was the rev um, regimental band. I don't know how you guys feel, but if I saw that coming and I was wounded, it would not make my heart feel terribly good. You know, tomorrow may start here for these ECU students, but it usually ended right there on the battlefield for the soldiers when they saw these guys coming. And then came Dominique Lerre. He was a fine young Frenchman. He became, began medical school at 14. Uh, back then, of course, medical school was nothing more than a, an internship, read a couple books in Greek, and that was the end of it. He became a ship's doctor by the age of 21. About age 22, 23, he gained favor with Napoleon, became his personal surgeon, and followed the army around. And he did that from 1797 until, surprisingly, became unemployed in a pesky little battle called Waterloo in 1815. Now, during that time, he saw that there was no way of evacuating the soldiers from the battlefield. And he observed that and thought that there, there was probably a better way to do this. And they had something called the flying artillery in the French army at the time, where they would take the artillery shells and the gunpowder, etc., and they would take it in wagons and bring it up to the front lines, regardless of what the battlefield conditions were. So he decided to do that himself in what's called the flying ambulance. And that was the first recorded um, use of an ambulance or a carriage to carry people, uh, wounded soldiers back to to the hospital. Um, some interesting things about him as well, he performed one of, if not the first, pre-anesthetic mastectomies on a French writer. Surprisingly, she lived and lived for about another 40 years afterwards. He was held in such high regard by both his allies and his opponents, he was captured numerous times. He was never executed because he would treat both the enemies and the Frenchmen alike. In fact, the British at Waterloo had a standing order not to shoot at him or his men because they valued his contribution so much. And this is an example of what the flying ambulance looked like. They could carry up to three men, and it was piloted by a person whose only real qualification is being crazy enough to drive as fast as he could across the battlefield. And things about stayed the same as that through the Civil War. Um, I'm going to move back a slide. And including at the Battle of Bull Run, the Union Army, in the first major battle of the Civil War, suffered 2,708 casualties. Many of them died because the stretcher bearers, after seeing their first real battle, fled, they ran away. Most of the wounded who lived only lived by making the march back to Washington, 27 miles away. Um, so, about the same time in the civilian world, we have the Society for the Recovery of Drowned Person. This began in Amsterdam, where a lot of people drowned for various reasons in the canals. And this began in 1767, and uh, they resuscitated 990 people by 1802. Now, you're probably wondering about that picture. I'll get to that in one second. This led to, I need to 
This led in London to, let me get this right, the Institution for Affording Immediate Relief to Persons Apparently Dead from Drowning. Not the best acronym in the world, but extremely effective. It became the Royal Humane Society and provided resuscitation kits, including tobacco enemas at various points along the Thames for first responders to use. And what this was, was uh, just as it sounds, a tobacco enema. You would put a, uh, a tube of some type up the rectum and you would blow tobacco smoke in it. And this was considered resuscitative for someone who had drowned. Uh, the first account I could find was in 1746. A uh, man's wife was pulled from the water, apparently dead. Amid much conflicting advice, a passing sailor proffered his pipe and instructed the husband to insert the stem into the wife's rectum, cover the bowl, and blow hard. Miraculously, it was reported the woman survived. Somehow, they made thousands of saves this way and continue this day in some form or facet. After that, we have the Bellevue Ambulance, which was really the first civilian ambulance per se. And this came around in 1869. And this was used to disevacuate people off the streets due to both cholera and other infectious diseases as well as injuries. So what do you put on an ambulance in 1869? A horse is good. And then you put an intern, which back then was petrified and had very little idea what to do and had very little edu education as well. Some splinting materials, and that's from the actual guidebook of what to load on your ambulance. Two tourniquets, no more, no less. Half dozen bandages. Two ounces of a vial of persulfate of iron. And finally, I'm not sure if this is from the intern or the patient, one full bottle of brandy. As things moved along, began getting motorized carriages, motorized ambulances, both electric and gasoline. In this case, this was an electric ambulance, the first ambulance they had that was non-horse powered. The big advantages from this in 1900, if I can get the PowerPoint to work, and carry up to three patients. It's very eco-friendly, of course. At a charging port of the hospital, they could keep it charged while they dropped off their patient. Both of these were donated by doctors at $5,000 a pop at the time. It was fast at 16 miles an hour. And unlike other hybrids, this one actually stopped. There were no floor mats to speak of and no dynamic braking systems. <laughs> As we moved on, of course, we had motorized carriages. In the World War I, it really started coming into really its own domain started driving the patients back, and the mortality rate in World War I was about 8%. If you made it and didn't die from your wounds, it was 8% your chance of living after that. By the time World War II came around, it was down to 4.5%. It's the product of better trained medics, having your surgeons closer to the battlefield, and again, a faster way of evacuating them off that battlefield. By Korea, they had pioneered the use of the MASH unit, which was even closer to the front lines. They evacuated about 1,800 patients by helicopter, excuse me, 18,000 patients by helicopter, and brought them to immediate surgical care. This brought the death rate down about 2.5%, which is roughly where it stands now. And again, in Vietnam, actually, death rate went up to about 2.8%, but that was more as a product of the wounds, more than it was the transport. The average transport time with surgeons was less than one hour, and that's from all points inside of Vietnam, as an aggregate. Oh, remarkable achievement when you think about it, and they flew out over 200,000 wounded patients during that conflict. Now while this is happening, the civilians were also slowly, very slowly developing their services. You have the Roanoke Volunteer Rescue Squad, which is the first rescue squad in the country, and that was in 1928. <coughs> there we go. It was uh, organized by Julian Stanley Wise after he had watched a young boy drown in the river and no one was able to rescue him or do anything about it. Now this started mostly as the traditional rescue squad. They had very little training, maybe a first aid course at best, and they're mostly to pull people out of there. But as of about 1930, they started getting more into the medical end of things. Everyone had to take a first aid course. And during a polio epidemic in the 40s, they actually bought and provided iron lungs and brought them around to various polio patients as a way of expanding their services out. I couldn't find a picture of an iron lung in the back of an ambulance, but apparently it did exist. Now, if you didn't have a volunteer rescue squad in your time, some of you folks may be a little older than I am, how did you usually get to the hospital if you didn't drive yourself? Somebody drove you. And if not? You know, exactly. Yeah. 
Who is the last person you'd want to see if you're having a heart attack? Probably him. But yet, more than anyone else, morticians had a corner on the market. And that's for three big reasons. Number one, they had the equipment. They had hearses, which were the perfect body-shaped transporting device. Number two, it created a lot of goodwill in the community because you're transporting these people. No one would want to have the number of local funeral home hanging around the telephone, but they would sure have it for the local ambulance, which just happened to go to the same place. And number three, it's an incredible tax write-off. You take your hearses, and after they're too decrepit to use for the dead, you start using them on the living again. And that's how it worked. I got a picture here as a fact. These are all, this is the ambulance service for um, a small city that remains nameless in Virginia. When they stopped using their hearses for anything else, they converted them into ambulances. And unfortunately, the training at the time was pretty much non-existent. All you had to do was have a license and be willing to leave skid marks when you stopped. In North Carolina, 50% uh, of all ambulances were operated by funeral homes as recently as 1965, and only 18% of them were actual purpose-built ambulances. Everything else is either hearses, pickup trucks, or whatever you could find. Well, things began to change in 1966. There was something called the EMS White Paper came out. It was Accidental Death and Disability. And what this did was chronicle the problem that America kind of knew we had, but didn't really know the extent of it. It showed that we had an incredibly high death rate due to car accidents. It was more than doubling every 10 years. And that nothing was really being done about it. We didn't have any kind of notification system didn't have a really good, efficient way of transporting patients outside of the funeral home, and it certainly wasn't skilled. And once you got to the hospital, you didn't have emergency physicians. You didn't even have an emergency department in most cases. If you were lucky, there'd be an intern, a dermatologist, etc., on call that night who could help you take care of your injuries and tide you over until the morning. Short, if you got hurt, make sure you've updated your will. The number you have reached, 911, has been changed. No, in 1968, as a result of the white paper, 911 came into existence. And this is the first time it, that people had a centralized way of contacting the fire, police, and EMS. And even in 2009, the most recent statistics, only 93% of Americans have access to 911. It's interesting, in Nome, Alaska, they had 911 before a large part of North Carolina does, and there's still places in the mountains and out in the swamp around here that do not have it. And along with 911, the white paper really started to spur physicians and people in the community to really start getting out there and form paramedics. Which at the time, a really skilled medical provider that was not a physician was, for the most part, unheard of. And these are some of the people that really started it. Miami, Seattle, and LA County all started paramedic programs about the same time, between 1968, 69, and 70. And he had six total ambulances and three programs. It totaled about 15 people. And one of those was R. Adams Cowley. He was in Baltimore, and he was a trauma surgeon, a spectacular man, and he really pioneered what we now take for granted called the golden hour. He, after much research, realized that an hour, if you could get a patient to the hospital an hour, greatly increased their chances of living. And his legacy lives on in the Shock Trauma Center in Baltimore, the only purpose-built trauma hospital of its kind. It has 13 bays dedicated just to resuscitation. Uh, it's got dedicated ORs right next to those bays and is made just for taking care of trauma patients. When he began, it was originally called the Death Hospital and the Death Lab because so few people were living in the 1970s as a result of trauma. Now it's considered the best place in the country and unfortunately still the only one. But you can trace lineage from our trauma center, UNC's, et cetera, directly back to this one. Then we have this. So in addition to hearses, uh, Dr. Cobb, for instance, decided that they needed a little more space for their ambulances. And they couldn't find anything really out there. So they decided to start appropriating Winnebago's for the cause. And your first six ambulances were actually Winnebago's and other assorted airstreams, etc. They would drive down the road with a big hospital bed bolted down to it. And this is what you would see if you called 911 and were reporting you had a heart attack. There's no way of getting the stretcher out of there. You had to walk into it, and hopefully you'd walk out of it as well. Now, in addition to the Winnebago, we made all sorts of other advances. How old do you suppose that defibrillator is on the left? 
Right on. Yeah, 1947. This was the first defibrillator. This was built in the hospital. It was used by Claude Beck. These are actually two spoons. He drilled on a lathe a couple of pieces of wood to go around it, took two lamp cords, plugged it in the back. And that was the first defibrillator. It could only be used inside an open chest cavity directly against the heart. Hopefully he cleaned the spoons beforehand. And he also used it in 1947 for the first time in a 14-year-old boy. He had a congenital heart defect. He had a heart attack on the table. They did CPR for 45 minutes while they gathered up the pieces of this, including a couple car batteries, and brought it into the operating room enough to shock him. It was successful, and it led to what we have now, which is on the right, which can pretty much do everything except bake you a pancake. The original one of this, I don't have a picture of it, the ones they had on ye old Winnebago here weighed about 140 pounds, had a stack of car batteries next to them, and you could not move them. You were limited to your space by about this much electrical cord, and if you couldn't get it there, that was about all there is to it. Another thing we have is called intubation. If no one knows what that is, it's putting a tube down somebody's throat to help them breathe. Where if they've had a heart attack, they've got an obstruction, they just can't breathe on their own. And it first appeared in 1020 and then was forgotten. It appeared again with Vesalius, a renowned medical educator, in 1543 and was forgotten. Till 1869 when Friedrich Trendelenburg performed the first modern intubation. It was continually refined since then until World War I where Sir Ivan McGill and Robert McIntosh adapted it for field use and they were actually intubating soldiers in the field that had facial trauma and couldn't breathe on their own. And then it eventually filtered its way down to the ambulance where paramedics, depending on the agency, have had mixed success between 75 and 95 percent of getting the tubes most of the time. Honestly, not nearly as good as an anesthesiologist, but considering the conditions, not terribly bad. So what was in the first paramedic curriculum? Would it scare you if I said that this was the textbook? Not much to it, especially when you consider that 10 years before, this was the first aid textbook. So you had 60 hours of emergency victim care, 6 hours of vital sign observation, and 30 hours of in-hospital training. And that's it. You were cut loose on the street. You could administer drugs, you could shock people, you could go to your heart's content. Granted, this was all under physician direction. You were tied by a radio and could only do what he or she said, but still meager, meager training at best. If you get some comparison, this is about half the textbooks for today's paramedic class. There are about four more classes after that one, but that's about the bulk of it. Let me explain something to you. So emergency. A lot louder than I wanted. Has anyone ever heard of emergency? Good, good. Emergency came along in 1972, a few years after the EMS white paper. And emergency did more than probably anything else in America to change paramedicine and EMS for the better. This is a spectacularly fact-based program that was came just as paramedics were starting to hit the streets. And it really documented their evolution throughout the 1970s. And it did a lot of things for a lot of people. Interestingly, it had a follow-up cartoon called EMS Rescue Plus Four, where they added four kids and a chimpanzee in an ambulance that followed afterwards. I've worked with a lot of partners in my life, some of them smelly, but I've never had anyone throw feces at me like they did in that cartoon. It's a little weird. Now, effective emergency. Now, at the beginning of the show, there were 15 paramedics in those three programs in the entire country. By the end of it, after six years, there are paramedics and training programs in every state, from Alaska, Hawaii, etc. Thousands of them. Namely because people watched this show and they said, you know, why don't we have that? Why do we still have funeral homes taking care of business when we could have paramedics out there? Did a number of things. It also helps inspire the Federal EMS Systems Act of 1973 for a few years before it got vetoed, but that's another story. That really helped to fund these programs that never would have gotten the local funding otherwise, and it helped standardize the EMS curriculum we have today. And more than anything, it helped inspire an entire generation of us to really go out there and care for people. And unlike Grey's Anatomy, it was very real and very accurate. Now another thing, you have your ground-based ambulance. What you didn't, what I haven't covered was air transport. Now this is the Easily the fastest and you know, best way to get a trauma patient far away from a hospital there, unless it was in 1870. 
when you had a hot air balloon was about the only way you could get someone out. And that started with big surprise when the Germans invaded France and they had to evacuate the wounded. Again, it was also used in World War I, especially in World War II, loading patients in the back of airplanes and carry them from islands in the Pacific and from Europe back in country. A helicopter was first used towards the end of World War II. Um, it was just coming on the scene at the end of the war and it was used to evacuate airmen that had crashed in Burma. Since then, it got refined a number, a great deal, I'll talk about that in a second. One thing that came around in 1928 was the Royal Flying Doctor Service. Has anyone ever heard of this before? Good, it was kind of a peculiar peculiarity to Australia, and it's still around today in a number of forms. Having the big, vast amount of space that Australia has, they needed a way to evacuate these people from the outback to hospitals. So they came up with the Royal, Fl Royal Flying Doctor Service. And this was started by Reverend John Flynn, like I said, in 1928, as a result of a gentleman named Jim Darcy. I'm going to try and read through the story real quick. Jim Darcy was found injured in Western Australia with a ruptured bladder by some friends in 1917. He was transported over 30 miles, or 12 hours, to the nearest town. He was met by the postmaster, who was also the only man in the settlement trained in first aid. He, Tuckett, the postmaster, said there's nothing that could be reliably done for the injuries. And they tried unsuccessfully to contact doctors by telegraph. They got through to a doctor in Perth, and communicating by Morse code, Dr. Holland, a doctor in Perth, guided this Mr. Tuckett through two bladder operations using the only sharp instrument available, a penknife. Dr. Holland then endeavored to get out there, and after 10 days, he traveled bleh, there we go, by a cattle transport Model T Ford and horse-drawn carriage, only to find that Darcy had died the day before. Interestingly, he did not die from the operations, which were a success, but from undiagnosed malaria. Thus, the Royal Flying Doctor Service was born. And this, in 1972, was the first civilian agency. This was out in Colorado called Flight for Life. And this is inspired a lot by the success of Korea and Vietnam. Like I said, there are 18,000, 200,000 people transported, respectively, during those wars. In 1972, the Flight for Life, and it flew about three, 400 calls that first year and had a great success rate. It proliferated incredibly well since then. And now we have more than 500 different agencies nationwide. In our country, we have eight of them, and then three helicopters right here with our very own East Care. And the advantage of them, in addition to the fast flight, is they have a greater scope of practice. Um, East Care and other things, um, agencies can do ultrasound, both of babies and of trauma victims, to be checking for injuries, do blood transfusions do um, inter-aortic balloon pumps. If you're having a heart attack, we can put a balloon up in your aorta and supplement your heart's circulation until you can get to a catheterization laboratory and all sorts of other procedures. Some wonderful pictures of East Care. Well, we've got three helicopters all due to be replaced this year. They ran about 3,500 missions last year. Did everything from trauma to high-risk neonate transports to strokes, heart attacks, you name it. They've flown everywhere from just on the west side of Raleigh to here, depending on the need. Now what about North Carolina? North Carolina has been slightly behind the times, but not by too much. In 1977, coincidentally the year emergency ended, there were 37 paramedics in the state. By 1982, bless you, there were 469 providing life, advanced life support in 22 counties, most of them concentrated around your big population areas, Asheville, Charlotte, and then the Raleigh area. As of Friday, there were 6,459 paramedics. They're providing care at a paramedic level in 88 of these counties. I guess not surprisingly, all the counties that do not have paramedic level care are in the east, as due to a low population, uh, or frankly poverty, a lot of low tax base, not able to fund it. And we've got Hyde, Martin, and then Bertie in particular all function at an EMT basic level. The reason that Bertie is uh, intermediate is there are still three people that are licensed as intermediates that retired there, but they're not actually functioning. So there's a little bit of work still to be done in the eastern part of the state. So I've been talking about paramedic, intermediate, and basic. What does that mean? Well, an EMT basic has about 200 hours of training. Have basic life support, oxygen, splinting, and more than anything else, learning how to drive fast and get people to the hospital. EMT intermediate can push about 10 drugs, things like asthma attacks, allergic reactions, um, some cardiac drugs, things like that, and can also intubate people if need be. 
And a paramedic, at least by today's standards, can give about 60 drugs, and that's plus or minus depending on the system. We can monitor your heart rhythm, diagnose heart attacks, we can defibrillate you, pace you, do a number of different things. We can intubate you, we can start IVs and push medications that way. If need be, we can inject medications directly into your bone marrow if we have to, do advanced surgical airways and some trauma skills. And then critical care, like East Care, can do even more skills, like what I talked about before. And the paramedic curriculum, well, you saw the textbooks, you have to take a dedicated anatomy and physiology class first off, and that's at a college level. And then you have to do about 2,000 hours of training, about 1,000 of that didactic, and about 1,000 of that out in the hospital, in both the operating room, the ICU, the emergency room, et cetera, as well as out on the ambulance and maintain minimum number of continuing education each year. And just like nurses, there are two ways you can do it. You can get a two-year associate's level degree, or you can get a bachelor's degree or master's. The skill sets are a little different, but the amount of training is roughly the same. Now, what about the future? I've done a quick tour through history. Yeah, bored someone so much he's going to the bathroom, as a matter of fact. Now, everyone's heard of the tricorder, I'm sure, from Star Trek back in the day. Well, we're pretty much coming up on that. On the right, you see an ultrasound machine. It's about the size of a cell phone now. You can take this out in an ambulances. In fact, we have these on East Care right now. So you can diagnose traumatic injuries. You can even diagnose broken bones with ultrasound, as well as what you'd traditionally think of it as being used for. Yeah. Now, about the future. Besides that, you have the people involved. And what it takes to be a paramedic? Well to be resourceful and calm under pressure. Which reminds me kind of the uh, early defibrillators, but cautious but always evolving. And nowhere is that more apparent in medicine. What we did five years ago, we're not doing today. What we're doing today, we're not gonna be doing in five years. If anyone's kept up on the CPR guidelines, they change every time the wind blows, every two years at a minimum. We've gone from doing five compressions every cycle to 30 to 15 back to 30 again, and it's gonna change this August. Medicine is constantly evolving as we get more research, and that's, no more is that more true than when we're out on the ambulance. And of course, a well-developed sense of humor, and especially in a college town where we have, well, I'll just let that be. If I leave my parting shot, remember it's an emergency vehicle, not a taxi. We've had a lot of problems in the past years, especially in places like Greenville that don't have enough ambulances. There's been a lot of and I won't call it abuse, but just miseducation by the public. And that's something we're slowly trying to correct. But we've come a long ways. Now, this is the agency I work at right now, uh, back in 1952 when it started. Luckily, we don't wear uniforms like that anymore. But we've evolved into a, hopefully, a mature, dedicated, and fairly smart service. But despite that, that, there's always someone that's going to screw it up, just like any other profession. And things do happen, it's always a growing process. And finally, one thing I wanted to do, especially being here at East Care, um, being a flight paramedic, it's rough. East Care's had its own loss, um, lost three people about a decade, uh, maybe two decades ago now, I'm not sure of the year. And pretty much every service I've worked at has lost people as well. I can't think of a single service in this country that hasn't had a wreck for whatever reason. So. I usually try and end things on this note. Uh, 2008, unfortunately, was a terrible year. And so far, we're doing better this year. But like anything else, safety is a, a big factor. So, it, yeah. Just something to be appreciated. I know every day I appreciate it as well. And you know, if you see any of these guys in East Care, they're every day putting their butts on the line, flying in weather like this, trying to take care of people.